Mr. President, uh, members, ladies and gentlemen, it's a, it's a great honour to be asked to uh, present a discourse at the Royal Irish Academy. It's an enormous challenge because I know I'm speaking to some old friends in the audience who are deep experts in the area I'm going to speak on, some wonderful scientists who are, are, are leading academicians in their own disciplines, and a general audience. So I hope I manage to get at least two or three of those at, uh, and, and touch on your interests uh, 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 at least sometimes during the talk uh, this evening. This is where I work. Uh, as the President mentioned, it's called the Institute of Metabolic Science in Cambridge. And in it, we broadly ask two questions. One question is, why are some people fat and some people not? And the other question is, when you get fat, why do you get sick? And we try and undertake science to understand those very basic questions and using that science try and improve the outlook of people with obesity, diabetes and related endocrine and metabolic uh, disorders. Now, what I'm really going to talk to you about today can be rather simply put in the kind of <clears throat> map of physiology is how might you avoid type 2 diabetes and what does understanding its etiology tell us about how you might avoid getting type 2 diabetes. Well, the first thing you might want to do if you avoid type 2 diabetes is what we say maintain energy balance. In other words, over a long period of time, keep your energy intake and your caloric intake matched with your energy expenditure and don't gain weight. So that's essentially a, a very key uh, first step. But of course, many of us, myself included, find that a challenge. <laughs> and, uh, but if you can't do that, then if you're going to gain weight, then please put your weight in the professional depot which was designed to carry it, which is your adipose triglyceride store. This is a professional uh, energy storage depot. It evolved to store energy in, in, in periods of energy excess so that we could access it rapidly uh, <coughs> during periods of energy uh, deficiency. And so, it's, so the second step in avoiding diabetes is to safely put that excess energy in the adipose depot. If, however, that is <coughs> a challenge and that <coughs> fat starts causing mischief in the target tissues for insulin, which are mainly the liver and skeletal muscle, then as long as you can maintain the sensitivity to glucose metabolism of, that, <coughs> of insulin, you'll be fine. So liver and muscle are key players in this, and they're able to respond to insulin in terms of insulin's suppression of glucose production by the liver and <coughs> insulin stimulation of glucose going into skeletal muscle. As long as that's working, you won't become insulin resistant and you won't develop uh, diabetes. But many people do become insulin resistant, yet not all become diabetic. Because the final step is the insulin producing cells of the endocrine pancreas uh, differ enormously in their efficiency and their longevity uh, between individuals. And as long as you have excellent pancreatic beta cells, you can probably cope with a degree of insulin resistance all your life without decompensating and developing <coughs> type, type 2 di di diabetes. So I'm going to talk today about two aspects of this particular equation. The first will be what has biology and genetics in particular taught us about this top part, how we best maintain energy balance and so how, why some people are lean and some people are, are obese. And then the next part of my talk, I'm going to talk about this aspect, the interaction between the fat and, and, and the liver and muscle, and why some people get insulin resistant at, at, at modest degrees of obesity and others avoid it at very <coughs> substantial degrees of obesity. And again, what genetics has helped te teach us uh, uh, about that. I won't talk <coughs> about the uh, work in pancreatic beta cells, or that's where I started my scientific life, because about... 20 years ago, myself and a colleague called Andrew Hattersley had a kind of Tony Blair, Gordon Brown, Granita pact, where we, where we kind of split the, we split the organism in the middle and decided that the west side of Britain would deal with the pancreatic beta cell, and those of us in, in Cambridge on the east would actually focus our attention on, on, uh, on obesity and, and insulin resistance. And that's worked out reasonably well, because Andrew is also a, a fellow of the Royal Society at this, at this stage. So, uh, contrary to popular uh, misconception, obesity is not uh, a new disease. Uh, the Paleolithic, sculpt Paleolithic sculptor of the Venus of Willendorf, I don't think could possibly have conceived this entirely out of his imagination without having actually visualized a female of this degree <coughs> uh, of obesity. 
Uh, Hippocrates himself was much troubled by trying to work out what the best advice to give people with obesity was, and he suggested that you eat only once a day, take no baths, sleep on a hard bed, and walk naked as long uh, <coughs> as possible. So we haven't actually moved very much forward uh, as yet uh, from, the, from the era of, of, <coughs> of Hippocrates. Uh, and in the 18th uh, uh, century, a British physician famously opined that no age had seen more instances of corpulency than our own. So we're not the only age that has worried and wrung our hands about the prevalence of, of obesity. But of course, it has become much more prevalent in the last 40 or 50 uh, years. And, and uh, <clears throat> what are the explanations for the secular increases in prevalence? And in my relatively non-epidemiological and, 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 and non-population health uh, uh, opinion, but what I've gleaned from working with uh, uh, the epidemiologists and behavioral scientists, my conclusions would be as follows, that there is sufficient explanation in the ease with which we can, ac with which we can access and ingest and are given <coughs> access to attractive calories and sufficient uh, reduction in the expenditure of calories in the workplace and the home for these together to be sufficient to explain what the obesogenic environment currently is. I don't think there's any need for magic factors or <coughs> However, a number of other factors have been suggested, such as antibiotics and environmental pollutants, such as the antenatal environment, your, your mother makes you fat, uh, or the social networks, your friends make you fat. Uh, and, and I think there is some interesting science behind some of those, but it's early days, I, I think, before we can really make a, 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 a conclusions about these. We always say, and I often start talks saying that genetics can not, has played no role in the increase in obesity in the last 50 years, 100 years, and that is largely true because our breeding, our, our genet genome doesn't change that quickly. But there are a couple of quirky uh, examples of how genetics can actually uh, make a rather rapid impact on, on, on change, and that is if fat people marry fat people, and, and they have more, and which does actually happen. So there is evidence of, of assortative mating. And also, in most societies, obese women give, have, have slightly more offspring than non-obese women. So there is a differential realized fertility. Uh, uh, so these are contributors, potential small contributors to the increase in, in, in obesity uh, prevalence. But the real question is, if, if, it's, if, it's so, uh, ob, uh, if it's so prevalent in the obesogenic, why isn't everybody fat? You know, one possibility is we all have the same biology. And it's just that those of us are lean are morally superior, President. <laughs> and and, and, and then people make conscious choices to remain, uh, remain lean, or indeed just be lucky and tend to be in environments that, micro environments that promote leanness. These are possible hypotheses. Another possible hypothesis, of course, is that perhaps people have different underlying susceptibilities to be lean or obese. That could be impervious to environmental factors, or it could interact with environmental factors. Probably won't surprise you, any of you have. Uh, thought and read about this condition, that I'm going to conclude that there are some different susceptibilities between people be who are susceptible to being lean and obese, and that this does interact profoundly with environmental uh, uh, factors. And that is kind of the broad message of what I'm going to talk about in, in, in the next uh, uh, few minutes. Um, but we've known about the heritability of obesity for a long time. We've known that it's one of the most highly heritable traits We've known that it's, it's somewhat less heritable than height, but more heritable than IQ, for example. So it's a, it, has, it has a strongly heritable uh, We know from remarkable uh, studies of children adopted and, and separated at, twins separated at birth in Sweden that <clears throat> the family into which one is adopted bears almost no relationship to your adult body weight, whereas the identical twin that you've seen has a correlation of at least 0.7 with your adiposity. So the, so the profound effects of gen genetics on, bo on body weight is well established. But what wasn't well established uh, until a few years ago, and we were fortunate to be at the forefront of this, was what sort of molecules, what sort, what, you know, can we get down and dirty and actually find out what these genes actually are? And it was uh, uh, in the late 1990s when working on a patient that I was seeing in my own regular clinic who was severely obese from a, young, <coughs> a very young age, we first of all detected a a very unusual biochemical abnormality in this patient's plasma in that she was unable to process pro-hormones into, into hormones. And then we had to clone the enzyme con 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 concerned, so-called PCSK1, 
And it turns out this patient was sorry, compound heterozygous for mutation, loss of function mutations in this so-called subtilisin family convertase. And in effect, her severe childhood obesity persisting into adult life was the result of that <coughs> defect. We now know that that enzyme processes numerous neurotransmitting peptides in the brain that are concerned with the control of appetite and, <coughs> and satiety. And she was, in effect, the first human being in whom a molecular explanation of obesity had become apparent. And that excited us very much about getting, doing more work in, in obesity. And we found, uh, following on from the wonderful work of Jeff uh, Friedman and Rockefeller describing the fact that this obese mouse, twice the weight of its siblings, and <clears throat> differing only by a single amino acid or a single a nuclear, in fact, an atomic difference because a single muta mutation in a base was because it lacked a, a, a newly discovered hormone coming from fat cells, leptin, which went to the brain and keeps the brain informed about the degree of adipose stores. And again, there was a query about whether this was relevant to humans, and we were fortunate enough to find the first children whose obesity was due to human uh, <coughs> leptin deficiency back in the late 19, 1990s. These first cousins were constantly hungry, constantly demanding food, attending many doctors and pediatricians who were informing them, the family, that they had simple obesity and the parents should just simply restrict calories and restrict food, uh, but they found this impossible to do despite being very caring, loving parents, and of course these children turned out to be homozygous for <coughs> lept human lept leptin deficiency. This led into a, a, f a fantastic era for us of going from a stage where, we, where nothing was known about the control, the molecular control of human <coughs> obesity to a, an explosion of discovery from ourselves and others around the world, including some wonderful colleagues who joined me at Cambridge and are still working as professorial and senior uh, colleagues. We discovered lots of these genes, genes that when disrupted cause obesity in a very penetrant way, not just associated with, have a very, if you are mutated, you have a very high chance of becoming obese including, for example, this MC4R here. About one in a thousand people in the UK and indeed in Ireland too will carry a loss of function allele in, in, that, in that gene that will severely predispose you to obesity in a major uh, way. It's commoner than cystic fibrosis, it's commoner than Duchenne muscular dystrophy, uh, <coughs> and it, it, it's a G protein coupled uh, receptor which, uh, which, uh, which, which is the most common site of mutations leading to childhood obesity. About 5% of our kids we've studied with severe obesity in children carry a causative mutation in melanocytes cortin 4 <coughs> receptor causing their obesity. What was became apparent at that stage is that the genes we were finding, we didn't know at the start when we started whether these would be fat cell genes or brain genes, we kept finding mutations and they were always in the brain. They were always in genes whose main job was in this very primitive part of the brain, the hypothalamus, which we share with the salamander. It's a very fundamental part of the diencephalon. Uh, and um, it's, it's an area that's responsible for sleep, for, for reproductive control, for water balance. There's a, a, very, a very large number of our, our vegetative functions are the control of are cited in this area of the, of, of, of the brain. And that's where they were ex expressed. And what, why were these children becoming obese? There, I guess obesity is extraordinarily simple. There can only be two fundamental causes. There's too much energy going in or there's not enough energy going out. There's nothing else that you can possibly, you know, there are numerous causes of those two phenomena, but ultimately that has to be, you cannot create mass. If there are many physicists here, there are very, very basic fundamental uh, 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 law. So what, was it energy in or was it mainly energy out? And what we found, and I think it surprised quite a lot of people at the time, when we simply took these affected children into the clinical research facility and measured their energy expenditure and their energy intakes, when we gave them ad libitum meals and measured them in a free, sort of free living ad libitum food eating session, they were, these conditions markedly increased food <coughs> intake with, the, with these children, including with these in MC4R mutations, we could take the mutation, put it in a test tube, work out how much cyclic AMP it was m making, and predict how much food the children would eat when they sat down at a meal. So a close correlation between molecular function and a complex human behavior, so showing how central this molecule is to the control of, of appetitive <coughs> behavior uh, in, 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 in humans. Over the years, my ex-fellow, Sadaf Faruqi, has taken over leadership in, in this area in our, in our institute, and we collaborate with the Sanger Institute in the Human Genetics Group, led by 
in Esmeralda and have found the group we, we together have found new genes uh, over the years. In the most recent work, uh, using whole exome and whole genome analysis, we're beginning to generate other interesting and tantalizing uh, uh, variants. This, 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 since we've recently published, this has increased in number. It looks like uh, you, know, the, you, you may have heard the Nobel Prize this year was won by people who discovered the, uh, the 24 hour circadian clock. Uh, 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 mechanism. We find a significant excess of loss of function mutations in clock among obese children compared to control children. So maybe that disruption, we know there's a, a close association between disruption of sleep and disruption and disruption of appetite. And I think we're getting a molecular handle on clock uh, <coughs> deficiencies uh, 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 here. One of the criticisms that we came across from people who were resistant to the idea that genetics were important was that you know, this is all very well for these rarities, but that surely can't be relevant for the common or garden. It can't be relevant for the obesity that happens across, you know, the variation in the amount of body fat stored in this room. Uh, can't be, the same processes can't be really involved, can they? Well, we've started over the years now, there's up to over half a million people worldwide, and with our colleagues in, in genetic epidemiology, uh, and this is work led by colleagues uh, uh, in, in Cambridge and, and, and uh, uh, Chicago and, and Boston, we've been able to look at nearly half a million people and ask what are the genetic variants that predispose people to be lean or, or, or thin across the population? And what are they? And what genes are they close to? And what genes do they influence expression? And particularly, which tissues uh, do those genes, are these genes mostly expressed in? And so, you know, you could say, well, let's guess. I, I guess the obese people tend to digest different than others. It'll be in the digestive system, or it could be in the, in, in, in the uh, muscle, it could, you know, burning off calories. And the remarkable thing when this data, you know, I, was, I was pretty stunned, but I was gratified because it mir mirrored exactly what we were discovering in the uh, rare conditions that obesity is a condition of the central nervous system. It's a brain disorder. These genes that are influencing uh, obesity across the populations are largely, if not exclusively, genes that are highly expressed within the central nervous system, and that's where they exert most of their, most of their, <coughs> of their action. And in, in lovely work done by my <coughs> wonderful colleague, Jane Wardle uh, at UCL, who sadly died far too young a couple of years ago, she finally put that, the final beautiful final brick on this because she had developed uh, a, a very predictive food eating questionnaires in childhood for food responsiveness and satiety responsiveness and these predict how if you give these questionnaires to children they will predict which ones will develop obesity and which ones will resist <coughs> obesity in, in, in the long term in terms of questionnaires and when you take the genetics and map that on the genetic scores those genetic scores actually map very nicely onto these behaviors, which then again map onto the BMI impact. So with the same quantitative links. So, so here we have a link from a gene to a behavior on a, on a validated questionnaire to a final weight in, 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 in the child. So very simply, and this is adapted from Jane's uh, uh, work, uh, you can summarize the whole of, of, of really what we and others and, and have done in the following way. Of course, during conditions of famine, nobody's obese. Duh. I mean, you, you need calories in uh, to be able to become uh, <coughs> obese. During limited food supply, only those with very high genetic susceptibilities are, uh, become obese. But now, when we have abundant, and we would argue superabundant <coughs> uh, 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 food being aggressively marketed, extraordinarily cheap, cheaper than it's ever been before, in a condition where we don't need it because we're not expending energy, all of those conditions means that even those with just average genetic susceptibility are becoming <coughs> predisposed uh, to obesity. I suppose what work we've done has shown what the nature of this susceptibility is, and the nature of the susceptibility is much more to do with appetite than it is to energy expenditure. That's not to say there are no genetic variations influencing how efficient people <coughs> are in terms of muscular exercise and how much they need. There are variations in that we're beginning to just recently scratch the surface of those genetics that influence energy expenditure as well as energy intake. But I don't think anyone could look at the data and say that appetite and satiety were the main and dominant features, which does, I think, have a public health uh, implication. It means that if we are going to impact on the environment positively, then 
and then the issues like food advertising, portion size, constant availability, uh, advertising placement on shelves in, in supermarkets, these are all extremely uh, important because they trigger these inbuilt biological uh, susceptibilities that are uh, on the appetitive uh, uh, side. Has our work done any good other than uh, give vague public health nostrums? Well, thankfully, in the case of one rare condition, the leptin deficiency, we, we've, we've been able to treat uh, now more than 35 children world, worldwide who lack leptin. It's a very rare condition, uh, but it is dramatically effective. It's lethal in the untreated state. Most of these children die. They die of obstructive re re respiratory complications of massive morbid obesity. And with leptin treatment, they are all entirely normal. So you can restore these children to normal body weight lifelong. The longest uh, treated patient now of ours has been treated for some 15, 16 years, and she's just had delivered her baby. So it's the first leptin-induced uh, next generation uh, 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 has been born. Uh, and uh, So we've, we've had that. We've also learned a lot uh, by treating and, and looking at human physiology before and after leptin. I think this is one of the nicest experiments that we did with my colleague Paul Fletcher, a neuroscientist in, in Cambridge. We were able to take uh, a couple of adolescents who'd never seen leptin before and show them pictures of food uh, and then put in an MRI scanner so that we could look at the areas of the brain that are associated with addiction and reward, etc. Showing these kids pictures of footballers or money or cars, not a flicker. Showing them pictures of food, e even broccoli. Uh, <laughs> They're, they're, the areas of the nucleus accumbens and the areas associated with addiction and reward lit up like a beacon uh, in, in, the, in their brains. And then within three days of giving them leptin, way before any change in their body weight, <clears throat> this was totally normalized. So here's this little humble hormone like a cytokine coming from your adipose tissue. And it's going up there and telling your brain, the very sophisticated bit of your brain you think you're in charge of, it's telling your brain and influencing its response to visual stimuli of food. So I think it's a very important example of how our sort of humble lower brain is totally interacting with our higher uh, 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 selves to, to, to end up with the ultimate behavior. Uh, it's not the only therapeutic that started from, from the work that we and others have been doing more recently. Uh, there's been dramatic effects of the replacement in children who lack the ligand for the MC4R receptor I was telling you about, which is one step down from leptin in the brain. And first two patients, this is not our work, this is done by others. We don't have any of these patients of our, uh, uh, our own in, in Cambridge, but they, they have got dramatic, similar sort of tremendous uh, impact. We have used in a clinical trial cetamalanotide in kids who have one functional copy of MC4R, uh, and it at least it's as effective in those as it is in wild-type children. So we have at least got a, a, a possibility of using a new treatment for, uh, for this much larger group of children. So we work away at these, at these rare disorders, trying to work out where the blockade is, and trying with our companies, in it, with our colleagues in industry, trying to find ways of bypassing these with molecular pharmacology. Uh, a little, a little aside, I just thought I'd share with you some fun. We had a vet who's doing a PhD in the lab who decided she wanted to stay on and do veterinary research. And we thought that Labradors are pretty interesting because they're very hungry. And we were extraordinarily lucky and we discovered very quickly, uh, and this is an, an Irish student who was with us uh, 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 at the time, we discovered very quickly that Labradors actually have a very high prevalence of a deletion of part of that gene that impacts on MC4, on MC4 uh, R. And they even, it seemed to be increased frequency in, in assistance dogs, leading us to speculate that they might be more trainable because they're more keen on food. <laughs> and and, and uh, a, little, a little aside into, into canine behavior. And, and, uh, uh, so in the, uh, this part of my talk, I'm going to move from above the neck, if you like, to below the neck. So the first half is a kind of neuroscience part of the, of the talk, and this, this part is about metabolism. So why is it? that if we have chronic overnutrition, energy intake greater than energy expenditure, why do we get sick? Uh, <clears throat> you know, we use that term, obesity. It's, we often, I think obesity often uses, induces a degree of brain freeze, as we all have a lot of bigotry and associate. We kind of think in a certain rigid way about it. I actually prefer to think of it as a chronic overnutrition. Think about energy intake greater than energy expenditure. Because the adverse consequences are interesting and varied. People with obesity have higher amounts of knee arthritis, reflux esophagitis, sleep apnea. They also have certain cancers which are markedly increased in, in, in prevalence. They also have a range of metabolic and endocrine bad consequences. So all of these are bad consequences. 
But is it really likely that an expanded mass of triglycerides in your fat cells are causing all? You know, how, how would a, an expanded mass cause those? You can easily imagine how the mechanical and gravitational effects of weight could affect the knees, the, the, the intra-abdominal pressure uh, in closing the, the airways for sleep apnea. But to me, at least, it's not intuitively obvious why having an expanded mass of triglycerides in adipocytes leads to either the cancers or, indeed, the metabolic diseases associated with obesity. And perhaps, in fact, it's not. Perhaps the obesity of this expanded mass is merely a, bi merely a marker of this chronic energy excessive intake over expenditure. And perhaps this somehow is directly leading to these two. And this is just telling us that that chronic excess is happening. It's not actually causing it itself. It's just, it's just a, a biomarker, if, if you like. So in order to pursue that, we wanted to find something to study that was an intermediate between the energy intake, energy expenditure, and these range of metabolic diseases. And it seemed the most likely phenomenon is this phenomenon of insulin resistance. It's the closest and tightest relationship, although it's a very uh, broad, there's a broad range of uh, variation within it. But as your body mass index increases, and these are, these are within people who have got normal glucoses, to maintain that normal glucose, your fasting insulin has to rise. So the fatter you are, you have to make more insulin to, <clears throat> to keep your blood glucose normal, the fatter you get. But you see, some people who are obese are still got, if the normal range, let's say, is less than 60, quite a few people who are fat never get insulin resistance. But some, <clears throat> obviously, get profound <clears throat> in insulin resistance. So there's a wide scatter between people who do and don't get uh, <clears throat> insulin resistance. So, as I mentioned before, insulin acts largely on the muscle and the liver, and very little glucose. If I <clears throat> gave any of you 75 grams of glucose to drink, uh, and insulin had to do its job, where would it put its glucose? Well, only about half a gram would end up in fat tissue. So it's, it's liver and muscle that are really doing the, the main heavy lifting when it comes to insulin's work on, on, <clears throat> on, uh, uh, on glucose clearance. So how do we get from sustained positive energy balance to this defective glucose handling uh, at, at liver and muscle. Well, if you were to ask a, a hundred uh, researchers or diabetes specialists these days, they'd say, well, we've probably figured that out because we know that the fat cell gets big and we know that inflamed cells, inflammatory cells come in and the fat cell itself produces inflammatory proteins and these things all are bad for liver and muscle and it must be these adipocytokines that are the, the key culprits. Well, they may be. But uh, uh, let me give you another possible uh, explanation as to why, what might be happening. Uh, this, this is an explanation whereby my argument is that your big fat cell is not your enemy. Your big fat cell is your friend. Because that is by, this, by far the safest place to keep <coughs> excess nutrients, because it's a professional cell. And it's only when it, your fat mass starts reaching the limits of safe adipose storage, then you start getting into trouble. Because then what you do is you redirect nutrient in the forms of ectopic fat, dietary fat, that goes into the liver and muscle, and it's that that's causing the major <coughs> uh, havoc in, in, in the target tissues. And the reason I have, a, I have a sort of fondness and favor for this, or one of the reasons of this, apart from all the data, uh, one of the reasons I have a, I have a fondness uh, 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 for this is that we actually see a lot of patients. We, have the, we run the national service for people with a condition called lipodystrophy. These are people who are not, these are not thin people, because thin people means that you are pretty normal and you just don't eat very much and you lose, the fat goes away from your fat cells. But these individuals don't have enough adipose tissue. They, they are unable to make fat cells or they're unable to make triglyceride within fat cells genetically, or they get an autoimmune disease which obliterates their, their, their which is targeted to fat or obliterates their, their fat. And they all develop severe insulin resistance, severe metabolic syndrome, type 2 diabetes, heart disease, liver disease, everything that you would uh, 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 think about uh, that is associated with, usually associated with obesity. So it causes effectively all the complications of obesity, having not enough fat, fat, fat tissue. Now, over the years, with my wonderful colleague David Savage and again with Inez Barroso, we have discovered many of the genes or co-discovered many of the genes that cause human uh, uh, um, lipodystrophy. But I'm going to talk today about two quite rare ones, not because rarity is important, but because I think they're quite paradigmatic and they teach us a little thing that's much more generalizable about what's going on in metabolism. And these are 
<coughs> diseases called perilipin-1 deficiency and side C deficiency. These are <coughs> a mother and two daughters with perilipin-1 mutation. Uh, it's a dominantly inherited condition, and every one of these develops every feature of the metabolic symptom. They look fit and healthy, they look lean, but in fact they're lipodystrophic. They cannot make adequate enough amounts of, of, of fat cells. You can see particularly on the buttocks, they've got a rather masculine fat dis distribution. They have a mutation in one copy of this perilipin, and the C-terminus of one of the mutated copies is, is, is distorted. It has an aberrant C-terminal sequence, which removes normal sequence and puts abnormal sequence <coughs> on there. Now, perilipin-1 is an intriguing molecule because it only is expressed, literally only, there's not a molecule of it anywhere else other than in your white fat cell. That's where it lives, and it lives on the surface of this extraordinary thing, the unilocular droplet, the single <laughs> locus droplet. So 99% of the volume of your fat cell is a single glob of triacylglycerol, of triglyceride, with a monolayer of phospholipid ar 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 around it. And that <laughs> occupies it. The fat cell is often, was often described as like a, a, like a fried egg on a beach ball, with the fried egg being the nucleus and the cytoplasm, and the fat being the, the beach ball. But that beach ball is like 100% triacylglycerol, triglyceride, a glycerol molecule and three fat <coughs> fat fatty acid <coughs> uh, chains. Now, what happens in this condition, these, la these ladies I, I, I've, I've shown you? Here's health, what health looks like. And in the, fa in the fed state, Perilipin-1 is doing nothing. It's hanging around doing nothing, really. It's hanging on to its partner, CGI-58. But these are the key interacting proteins for, for perilipin-1, ATGL and HSL. And they're in the cytoplasm. They're not touching the droplet. Because what's going on when you're fed is triglycerides are being synthesized and put into the fat droplet. But as soon as you go to sleep overnight, so tonight at 3 or 4 in the morning as you're all sleeping, something totally different happens in your droplet. And it's a dramatic change. What happens is that because of the changes in your plasma hormone levels associated with fasting and, and overnight sleep, you get phosphorylation and signaling events happening, which do a remarkable range of beautifully coordinated things. And ultimately, the purpose of that is to deliver fatty acids, because your heart is largely going to be using fatty acids overnight as a main source of its cardiac <coughs> contraction. Many of your tissues will be, <coughs> will, will be using fatty acids, particularly for prolonged uh, uh, fasting. You, you've got a need for, the, for free fatty acids to be released from adipose uh, uh, tissue. So what happens is that these, these kinases phosphorylate perilipin-1. And what it first does is it kicks off this phosphorylation event kicks off the partner protein, CGI58, which grabs this purple guy down. And that purple guy, ATGL, starts the process of breaking triglycerides down to diglycerides, taking one fatty acid moiety off and sending it, and sending it through. The N-terminus end of perilipin causes it to grab the second guy, which does the second job, breaking down the diglyceride to, to a fat, free fatty acid. And then your monoacylglyceride mono acts kind of on its own and without, without much... Uh, need for control. So that's a beautiful system that is designed to uh, uh, deliver to you the free fatty acids in the fasting state and then to stop when the phosphorylation events stop and these things all to drift off when you're fed. And these poor ladies that I've, whose pictures I've shown you, all that's wrong with them, every single thing, their heart disease, their hypertension, their, there isn't a single thing they don't have. And it's all explicable because one copy of their perilipin has got a mess at the end of it which makes it unable to bind CGI58, which constantly, even in the fed state, is constantly breaking triglycerides down and delivering you free fatty acids, like an infusion all day long of free fatty acids. And that is itself enough to cause every feature of the metabolic syndrome that, <clears throat> that, that we know. It's, it, there's no carrier of these mutations that does not have these pathologies that, <clears throat> that I'm talking about. So another example, and in this case it's even a, a rarer condition, uh, is associated with a beautiful uh, little molecule uh, called side C or FSP2029, which just sits at the junctions of small fat droplets and permits, the, the, it's absolutely required to make small fat droplets become single fat droplets. If you don't have it, your fat cells are essentially full of tiny little fat droplets, which massively increase the surface area of, 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 of triglyceride available in the fat cell and massively increases the amount of free fatty acids that you can therefore <coughs> access. And we found the first patient with this deficiency a few years ago. 
And my colleague, David Savage, and this work is largely, almost entirely his beautiful work, but I thought I'd share uh, it with you. He decided he wanted to pursue this further because they were very rare humans. So took it into the mouse, made a mouse model that lacked side C, and then bred it to the OB, OB, the very, very obese mouse. See, what happened if you took this uh, mutation, put it into the OB, OB background? And what happens, uh, 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 first of all, is that you go from this amount of fat, and this is just a gonadal fat, to a tiny amount of fat, so you effectively cure the obesity of the OB, OB animal because you can't make <laughs> these big uh, fat cells. But the fat has got to go somewhere. So here's in the triglycerides, doubles in the serum, and here's the liver of this mouse. So a lot of that fat, instead of going into the, that is going into the, into the liver, causing a great increase of liver triglycerides. And when you do the studies of insulin sensitivity, you find when you put insulin into a, an OB, OB mouse, you have to put quite a bit of glucose still to, to keep the glucose normal. With, a, with this mouse, profoundly insulin resistant, severe insulin resistance. But the thing I found intriguing about this work is that, take it one step further, when we start looking at the adipose tissue, I mentioned to you that there's a prevalent hypothesis that adipose inflammation is really important, and the adipocytes, and the, these are the things that are causing insulin resistance. And remember, we've got a really insulin, probably the most insulin resistant animal we've ever seen, but in effect, this manipulation has cured its adipose inflammation. The adipocytes, crown-like structures and the macrophages all go away. Uh, the uh, circulating inflammatory markers here, here go away, the, the expression, gene expression of a whole variety. So effectively curing adipocyte inflammation at the same time as worsening in severe uh, in insulin resistance. So I think it really does call into question the necessity for adipose inflammation in the, in the, uh, in the biology of this uh, of, 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 of this insulin, of the link between obesity and insulin resistance. And kind of the last scientific story I'm going to tell you is, is where we, we, we work in a wonderful building which has a, a fantastic uh, group of, 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 of population scientists, molecular epidemiologists uh, uh, below us in the MRC epidemiology unit led by Nick Wareham. And we approach them to say, we found the, all these lipodystrophy genes. Can, we, can you test for us? We'd like to just test whether, well, you know, what, as I mentioned to you about the rare biology of obesity and then the common, having some commonalities, is there any commonality between these, insulin, these rare lipodystrophic syndromes and the general insulin resistance metabolic syndrome in the general population? And to test that, we asked them to, for the following multivariate variable. I, can you look for us at a very large population of, of, of data, nearly 200,000 people, with a combination of fasting insulin corrected for your degree of adiposity, your degree of obesity, high triglyceride levels and low HDL cholesterol? That's a classic uh, marker of so-called syndrome X. And what SNPs in the genome are associated with those? What, how, how many SNPs in the genome? And they said, well, there are 53 different SNPs in the genome which associate with this at a genome-wide level of significance with these, with, with, with these vari with this, uh, this complex uh, uh, variable, 53. And when we look at them in more detail, here's red is up, blue is down, red is up. Of course, these are red, blue, and red because this is how we defined the variables originally. So this is self-referential self data. But these are other data sets available in the world. These are publicly available data sets that you can now interrogate your data against. And gratifyingly, these SNPs, these variants, uh, uh, the single new, so these are s genes at which there's a single variant that's common enough to be detectable in, uh, readily, in the, and so they vary. There could be 50-50 in the population. There could be 95-5 in, in the population in terms of a different vari variant at a, at a different uh, uh, position in the genome. Now, what started to get intriguing was when we started looking at data sets about thinness, fatness, and body composition measured by, by DEXA. You can see quite a lot of blue there, which is a bit of a surprise because what we're saying is these are bad genetic variants for you, give you bad things, but when then you go and hypothesis free into a population that's had their body composition measured, they seem to be associated with thinness, lack of fat, not, not, not with <coughs> obesity. And if you dig into it in more detail, uh, it becomes more intriguing because what these are truly associated with in a big, in a highly significant way is they're associated with not having enough fat on your buttocks or thighs. So, <coughs> so these disease predisposing variants in a cluster appear to be reducing, associated with reduced uh, hip and thigh fat, if, uh, if you like, with only a very modest association with what we normally think of the bad fat, the visceral fat. That actually seems to be almost a secondary anomaly. When you cannot expand your hip and thigh, you start putting it into, into, your, visceral, into your visceral fat. And um, we then 
do the same sort of bioinformatic analysis that I showed you about the brain genes and ask which tissues are these genes mostly affecting. And again, dramatically, these are genes that are having their biggest expression effects in adipose tissue and in, in, in adipocytes. And we can look at people with extreme forms of this, and we find a great enrichment of these in people who have difficulty putting on fat in their limbs and things and keep, put, put fat on uh, centrally. So, and then when we take some of these genes and knock them down in cells, we show that they are pr predominantly involved in, in, the, in control of adipocyte development or adipocyte fat cell size. So there's a molecular biological basis to some, <clears throat> to some of this, this work. So it kind of brings me to a rather, uh, is a kind of, I, I use this analogy in, in, in public talks quite a lot because I, I find it helpful. Um, we, it's kind of what I call the soggy bathroom carpet or the sudden bathroom carpet model of, of metabolic disease. So, so here we have metabolic health. Uh, here's a nice clean carpet. You've taken the plug out of the bath. The, 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 you've left the tap on, but it's fine because there's a dynamic has reached and you've got a storage capacity in your fat cells and you reach a certain level and it stays there and everything's healthy and the carpet doesn't get messed up and that's metabolic health. Now we normally think about obesity and diabetes in terms of either taking too much in, or not expending enough, or a bit of both. And of course, that is true, that they are very important uh, factors. And of course, in those circumstances, what happens is you will progressively fill up your bath, and eventually you'll spill over and get the metabolic uh, uh, side effects. I think what our work on lipodystrophy and now on the more common metabolic has showed, what we've just not paid attention enough attention to is how big is your bath, because people differ enormously in the extent to which they can safely expand their adipose <coughs> uh, 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 depot. And indeed, there are extremely obese people. If you, if you read, read one of the tabloid newspapers and you see someone who has to have, to have the ambulance come in to knock out, the, or the fire brigade to knock them out to bring them into hospital, they're almost never diabetic because they can't get that side. They have, simply have an enormous, if, if they develop diabetes, they would lose calories in the urine and they would shrink. So they can't get to that super obese size, and they are the ones who have vast baths, if, if you like. But the problem that we've seen in terms of people with limited adipose capacity is even a modest degree of excessive intake over expenditure is enough to tip them into developing, into developing <coughs> insulin resistance and diabetes. So in work that the uh, first author is uh, Audrey Melvin, who's a, a UCD graduate, who's just come to do her PhD, uh, with me and on the side just did a couple of little clinical things, but this is a nice piece of work that she just published in Journal of Clinical Endocrinology Metabolism. Um, we've taken three patients, this is just one example uh, of an individual who has got a limited fat, you can see very little fat on the limbs, very little, but this person's got very severe diabetes on hundreds of units of insulin a day, very poor diabetic control, and <clears throat> what we've done is essentially uh, turned off the inward tap by doing bariatric surgery and by creating a, a, a metabolic environment whereby her appetite remains chronically suppressed. And within rapid period of time, we've restored her to complete metabolic abnormality as we have for other individuals, including those whose body mass index actually are below 30, so not even formally obese. So these individuals are having metabolic surgery, this form of bariatric surgery you may have heard of and uh, discussed. These people are not obese, but they are having tremendous metabolic benefits because we've been able, in effect, to provide chronic control of the tap while their bath is so small that it needs that, that tremendous control over intake to allow it to, uh, it to be controlled. So I'm going to finish by asking, going back to our original diagram and saying, what, what do we know now from the genomics and the genetic study that we didn't know before? Well, we give, I think, uh, five gold stars to the brain when it comes to the site that <coughs> where it controls the uh, desire to eat and the pressures to eat and the, and, the, and, and the intake. So genomics has really taught us a lot about the importance of maintaining energy balance. Uh, surprisingly, adipose tissue, which really has traditionally been viewed as a very passive recipient of calories, is really an enormously important active participant in the entire uh, uh, link between overnutrition and its adverse consequences. So the health of our adipose tissue and having healthy adipose tissue is really much more important, I think, than we, than we realize. And our ability to expand it in a safe manner rather than uh, 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 not expand it and have, have nutrients go elsewhere is hugely important. Uh, we found less action, if you like, in the classical insulin tissues. This may be uh, an artifact of difficulty of 
measuring these accurately, and we're doing more work at the moment on postprandial insulin resistance, which we're finding quite interesting, but less you know, molecular action in these tissues than we thought. And the work of my colleague Andrew Hattersley, Mark McCarthy, and others have really shown how important the genetics of, you know, you, you, essentially if you have healthy beta cells, no matter what's going on on this, you may get heart disease, you may get liver disease, you, but if you have very good beta cells, you'll never get diabetes, no matter what <coughs> uh, 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 happens. And, you know, surprisingly, given the amount of interest in the immune system and, 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 and diabetes, we find very few signals uh, in the innate immunity or host defense associated with, with diabetes and very, very little evidence from pharmacology that this impacts on insulin uh, uh, resistance. I know this may be heretical and I have long arguments with Luke O'Neill uh, uh, about this, but I think Luke might even be coming around to my way of thinking uh, when it comes at least to the parameter of insulin resistance. I think inflammation is extraordinarily probably important in the link with cancer, perhaps and in the link with cardiovascular disease, but in specifically in the link with insulin resistance, I think the evidence is, is diminishing rather than, in, <clears throat> rather than increasing uh, in, in that regard. So I finally like to finish and thank uh, my colleagues and collaborators. There are many I haven't had a chance to name all of the wonderful young scientists that have been worked with over over the years. Referring physicians, our funders, uh, the uh, uh, and particularly the patients, participants, and family. And, and recently, I've had to add a new a new uh, person to thank for the, for the, for the, for, the, for their work over the years. So thank you again for uh, your attention. Thank you.